All right, we are moving into part four of the materials, which focuses on the third component of the criminal justice system, corrections, or the third C. We covered the cops and the courts. In this section, we will cover the current correctional uh, process in all of the forms that it takes. Chapter 10 reviews community-based supervision, such as probation, and discusses alternative sanctions ranging from so uh, fines to electronic home monitoring. We will also explore the concept of restorative justice, which is a more modern approach to handling crimes and criminals. Chapter 11 introduces the history of corrections and also reviews the various forms of secure corrections being used today. And lastly, chapter 12 looks at the prison experience, including prison culture, treatment programs, and prisoner rights, along with the reentry into the community process and parole. And we'll also compare and contrast parole and probation. Uh, we know that the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. And that also holds true for the probation rate. The average probation supervision rate for all 50 states is more than five times the average rate for all European countries, including uh, included in the most recent uh, Council of European data. Several U.S. states with the highest rates of probation supervision include Ohio, Rhode Island, Idaho, and Indiana. They have uh, rates that are eight to nine times the average European rate. Uh, such stark differences exist despite the fact that many countries in Europe have overall crime rates that are quite similar to those in the United States. Although probation has often been thought of as an alternative, quote unquote, alternative to prison or jail sentences, the U.S. has achieved exceptional levels of punitiveness in both incarceration and community supervision. Over the past several decades, the number of people under probation supervision in the U.S. has increased greatly. Nearly 4 million adults were under probation supervision across America at the end of 2013. In all reporting European countries with roughly twice the population of the U.S., only 1.5 million adults were under probation supervision. Some New York numbers, uh, community corrections programs, according to data that they have compiled from the Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives, uh, there are approximately... 900, uh, I'm sorry, 95,000 adults under probation supervision across the state of New York, which is a d decrease. Uh, this is, by the way, these numbers are based in 2019. A decrease uh, of about 3,500 since the prior year. The adult probation populations uh, include about 46,000 people on felony probation, about 45,000 on misdemeanor probation, as well as about 4,800 people on probation from offenses other than felonies or misdemeanors, which would be something like a probation that transfers to New York after being convicted in another state. Uh, in addition, local probation departments supervise youth that are placed under uh, supervision by the family court, which includes approximately 25, 26 Hundred juvenile delinquent cases, which is a decrease of about uh, 259 cases compared to the prior year, and 655 persons in need of supervision. These are the even younger uh, children who are uh, in need of supervision. They're you know missing a curfew. They're staying. Um, they're skipping school. Those kinds of things. And, but that is a de decrease in and of itself to about 45 cases from the year before. Community supervision is uh, the most common form of correctional treatment because it doesn't make sense to lock up non-dangerous criminals in overcrowded and dangerous correctional facilities. It's also less costly to the states. Uh, in some places, the probationer pays their own supervision fee while on probation, they get to maintain employment and their family and community ties. They continue with their treatment needs. They're able to make the victim whole again if they have to pay them back. Um, it's hard to do when you're locked up. 
and it also gives them a quote unquote second chance. So let's start looking into these alternatives to incarceration. We have already kind of alluded to probation and that's where we're going to start and we spend most of our time. Probation is the most common method of dispensing correction treatment to convicted offenders. So what is it? A criminal sentence that suspends or delays a correctional term in a prison or jail so that instead of being incarcerated, offenders are returned to their communities for a period in which they must follow certain terms and conditions set by the court and be monitored by a probation officer. That's our definition of probation. So where does it come from? Where does it originate? How did it evolve? The idea of community supervision began during medieval times. The origin of probation can be traced to English criminal law of the Middle Ages. Harsh punishments were imposed on adults and children alike for offenses that were not always a serious in nature. This harshness eventually led to disconnect in certain progressive segments of English society that were concerned with the evolution of the justice system. Slowly, but surely, in an effort to mitigate these inhumane punishments, a variety of measures were uh, devised and adopted. Royal pardons could be purchased by the accused. Activist judges could refrain from applying statues or opt for a lenient interpretation of the statues. Stolen property could be devalued by the court so that offenders could be charged with a lesser crime. Other methods were created, such as uh, juvenile uh, judicial reprieve or recognance, which kind of are very similar, both, both work the same way. A judge could suspend the imposition of a sentence on condition of good behavior on the part of the offender, or if the offender shows rehabilitation, or that the offender can show they sought a pardon. Today, that's actually called a conditional discharge. Sureties is another form. These people... Uh, made themselves responsible for the behavior of the offender after the offender's release. Usually you see that with a parent and a child. The parent will take responsibility. John Augustus, the known as the father of probation, he is recognized as the first true probation officer. He was born in Woburn, Massachusetts in 1785. By 1829, he was a permanent resident of Boston and the owner of a successful bootmaking business. It was undoubtedly his membership into the Washington Total Abstinence Society that led him to the Boston courts. As a member of the society, um, they're required to abstain from alcohol themselves and were convinced that abusers of alcohol could be rehabilitated through understanding, kindness, and sustained moral secession rather than through conviction and jail sentences. So in 1841, he attended police court to bail out a quote-unquote common, common drunk uh, who was his, deemed his first unofficial probationer. The offender was ordered to appear in court three weeks later for sentencing. He returned to court a sober man, and he was joined by Augustus. To the astonishment of all of those in attendance, his appearance and demeanor had dramatically changed. The offenders, that is. So Augustus thus began a 18-year career as a volunteer probation officer. Not all of the offenders helped by him were alcohol abusers, uh, nor were all prospective probationers taken under his wing. Close attention was paid to evaluating whether or not a candidate would likely prove to be a successful subject for probation. The offender's character, age, and the people, places, and things apt to inf influence him or her, those were all considered. And Augustus was subsequently credited for founding the investigation process that we're going to talk about in a minute. One of three main concepts of modern probation, uh, the other two being intake and supervision. Augustus, who kept detailed notes on his activities, was also the first to apply the term probation to his method of treating offenders. And in 1878, Massachusetts authorized uh, appointment of a paid probation officer, and then other states followed suit, and so did the federal government in 1925 when they established their own 
probation system. So we have about 2,000 probation agencies in the United States. Half are administered from the state level, half are administered from the county or municipal level. Uh, each, I will tell you, each county in New York uh, has a probation department, so it's administered at the county level here. Uh, that supervises those offenders who have committed state felonies or misdemeanors or other crimes, as well as they supervise um, juveniles and pins, people in need of supervision, which are, as I just said, uh, young children. In some states, probation is carried out by a private contractor. Those include Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Michigan, Missouri, for example. I think there's a few other ones. Nearly 4 million current probationers. There's 4 million people currently on probation. But despite the decline of probationers since 2008, there still is about 2 million new probationers each year. So who are these probationers? Generally, they're Males, they're made up, males make up three quarters of the probation population. More than half are white, uh, non-Hispanic, and nearly a third are African-American. 20% are supervised for violent crimes, uh, such as, uh, you know, assault or uh, sexual assault or an arson. Um, 60% for a family offense, which could be some type of domestic violence or a violation of a order of protection or a court order or the victim in, involved in the crime was a family member so they deem it a family offense. So how do these individuals get a probation alternative? It's generally to qualify for this type of sentence it will depend on what crime the offender is convicted of. Most violent crimes do not qualify in certain drug offenses do not qualify, at least here in New York State. Anyhow, assuming an offender can qualify to receive such a sentence, it is the court that determines whether to place someone on probation or not. What results is a contract between the offender and the court. The contract consists of terms and conditions that the offender must abide by. Common rules uh, include don't get arrested again meet with your probation officer at times the officer says, whether that's at their office, at your home, or at your place of employment. Do not use illegal substances. Sometimes it says refrain from using alcohol. You have to be employed might be a condition, in, or if not employed, go into school. You have to take care of your family responsibilities. You might have to meet a curfew. There might be some treatment involved. There might be some payments made to the victim. So the court sets forth the specific uh, conditions. If an offender fails to do one of those terms or violates those terms, like gets arrested or doesn't show up to appointment, they may face a revocation or termination of their probation sentence and the court can sentence them to be incarcerated. So the probation sentence has, ter oh, has term limits. Probation sentence has term limits. They vary from state to state and in the federal system. In New York, felony probation terms are five years. Misdemeanors are three years. Misdemeanor sex offenses are six years. And felony uh, sex offenses are a minimum of 10 years. And some of them can go life on pro uh, probation. There are a couple other variations, but this is the basic structure that I outlined. If someone violates probation, the judge will have a hearing to determine whether or not to terminate uh, an offender's probation. That hearing is called, it's called a resentencing. There'll be a determination of the outcome. Sometimes the judge can continue the person on probation, but the court can extend the time. The court can sanction the offender for whatever violation they did and a sanction could be you can go to jail for a weekend but then you're right back on probation or the court can just terminate and send the person off to jail or prison for how long will depend on the conviction of the crime but offender the offender faces the maximum sentence set by the statute for the crime in which they're convicted of so what I just described was a direct sentence 
to probation scenario. That was a direct sentence. A suspended sentence is when the court actually imposed a term of incarceration, but suspends it on the condition that the offender successfully complete probation as set forth in the terms. So a judge might say, for let's say for a misdemeanor conviction, I'm sentencing you to one year in the county jail. That is suspended or hanging over your head on the condition that you complete three years on probation. So two and a half years into probation, there's a violated violation of the terms. Let's say the person commits a felony crime. Now there's a violation because the terms say don't commit any more crimes. The court can revoke probation and sentence the offender to serve the year in jail. This is called a suspended sentence scenario. A split sentence, it's just like it sounds. The court can sentence a person to partly jail and partly probation. In a split sent sentence, it is local time. It's not prison time. So it's a jail sentence. So six months in jail, followed by five years probation. That's a typical New York sentence, uh, felony sentence. Someone who's convicted of a felony where they get a split sentence. So what makes an offender eligible for probation? Probation was originally designed for nonviolent offenders. However, to reduce prison populations today, even violent offenders may receive probation, and it's going to depend on the crime. Also, besides violent criminals being allowed opportunities for probation, some have a criminal record. So even those with prior felony convictions may be allowed this alternative sentence as well. Usually it depends on what that prior history is, like a prior felony for DWI or a prior felony for assaulting somebody um, might allow for it, but nonetheless, it's going to have to play a, a role. Uh, the states and the feds, they differ from when probation is available for offenders, even for second offenders, those with criminal histories. So it'll be kind of laid out by statute, but that it's available. It's available if you have a criminal record um, to be allowed to be on probation. It's just not for first-time offenders. So what are the rules one has to follow while on probation? I gave you some examples already. They're set by the court. There are a set of 10 that are standard. They're set by New in New York State anyway. They're set by statute that everyone on probation has to follow regardless of the offense convicted of or the grade of the offense, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Usually they are, I don't know if I can give you all 10 off the top of my head, but it's usually report to probation, stay out of trouble, i.e. don't get arrested, don't leave the jurisdiction of the of the court. So if you're sentenced to a crime that uh, happened in Clinton County, you have to stay in Clinton County. Uh, usually report any police contact to the probation officer, answer all the, the probation officer's questions that they ask. Um, they're very generalized. Otherwise, the conditions are set on a case-by-case -case basis. However, generally they are standard terms for specific crimes. Somebody convicted of a drug crime uh, or even a, a DWI crime, chances are their, condi their conditions are going to include some sort of treatment component. Sex offenses are going to have some sort of registration as a sex offender or some sex offender treatment program that's going to be necessary. An assault case might have anger management. Domestic violence is going to have programming relative to partners and violence in relationships. Probation can recommend conditions. They often do, but it's the judge that sets them, and he or she can strike the re recommended terms as they see fit. Um, and then, you know, overall, there might be some specific conditions, restrictions that are tailored, tailored specifically for a particular individual. So how, do, how does the probation services uh, get administered, the administration of probation services? Well, it varies because it depends on the state. State administered or locally administered, ours are locally, it's New York County. There is no combined with parole services in New York State. Um, it's available in other states. I can't think of one off the top of my head. 
uh, but we're going to work with New York. A majority, uh, I'm sorry, probation officers, uh, their styles are influenced by who they are, what their personal values are, and what the department's general policies are to meet the goals of probation. You know, there will be a head, department head, who oversees all of the probation officers who kind of makes the policies. Probation officers themselves, they can approach their job differently, much like police officers, right? We talked about how police officers have different style and, and approach and how they may vary. Same thing with probation officers. Some take a more social worker approach, which treatment, rehabilit uh, rehabilitation, those types of goals uh, are key in helping the offender readjust to the community. That's one approach. There's the enforcer, the law enforcer, the other side of that seesaw. The, you know, they operate with the concern that it's, I'm supervising you, I'm controlling you, and we're doing this for public safety, right? Supervision, control, public safety are their key goals. And then there's the PO in the middle, right? Who blends those two concepts together. And that's generally what we see. However, I will tell you there's people on both sides of that social worker coin and law enforcement, but the majority of them kind of fit in, in the middle. So what are the elements of probation? What do they do? There are five, there are five primary tasks that probation does. The pre-sentence investigation, this is a very, all of their components are important, but I, I can't stress how important this one is. After an offender is convicted, uh, of their crime, but before they are sentenced, the court will direct the probation department to prepare a pre-sentence investigation report for the court to determine probation suitability for the offender. This report is called a PSI, pre-sentence investigation report, PSI. The probation will uh, then interview the offender look into his or her background regarding family history, education, employment, health, which is both physical and mental, any substance abuse issues. They'll interview the victim. Um, they'll get a statement in most cases. Should, they, should the victim not want to appear in court and make a statement? Probation is tasked with the job of getting a statement. They, the probation then will compile a report and submit it to the court with its recommendation whether they think probation is appropriate or not, along with any proposed conditions for uh, probation. So this document, the court relies on heavily in making its determination of whether or not to put somebody on probation. So they have a lot of um, power in that regard. Probation has a lot of power in that regard to ensure that the report is accurate but also very neutral. If you have somebody who's familiar with the offender, one way or the other, you could see that influenced in the report that they uh, have. And if they are pretty adamant about not wanting to supervise somebody, that may show in, in the writing, unfortunately, that it is a very important task that they have. Another job they do is intake. This is usually done with a probation violation where they, it, they kind of resolve the issue in-house without sending the case back to the court, but also with juvenile cases in the community, uh, police may recommend for an intake and see if probation can attempt to resolve the matter. And if they can't, then there'll be an ultimate filing with, with the court. That component doesn't necessarily happen with uh, adults where probation is acting like a mediator, at least not in this county. I believe it happens in Franklin County but not so much uh, here, and it's kind of rare, mostly done with juvenile cases. Risk classification, this is a big, um, a big job that they do, very influential. During the period of the pre-sentence investigation, as part of their report, the probation officer will and must evaluate the offender and determine his or her risk factor classification meaning that the probationer gets classified at a certain risk level, the risk, the risk of reoffending, the likelihood of success on probation, so that they 
will receive a designated or an appropriate level of treatment and supervision and control. So that can be a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk. A low risk, somebody's deemed a low risk, they're given more freedom. There's minimal amount of supervision. More likely to be on probation, quite frankly. Whereas high risk, supervise more, more extensively, these probation officers get a smaller caseload because they have these probation officers or these probationers with high needs. Generally, they have been convicted of a violent crime, arson, sexual assault, and it's usually a more senior uh, probation officer that has these kinds of loads. But also, when a judge sees that high risk flag in the probation report, that kind of sways a little bit on their bearings on whether or not they are going to place somebody on um, probation is what kind of risk they are reoffending. One of the judge's job is to protect the community as well. Remember that from uh, one of our beginning chapters, the whole point of uh, punishment. All right. Supervision. This is a big job that they do. Probably the majority of the PO's work is supervision. So they're monitoring clients in the community. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? They'll go to their house. They'll go to their employment. They'll have them come in and check out, the, uh, check in with their PO. The PO will contact employers, make sure they're working. They'll contact treatment to make sure they're going to treatment. Um, I kind of like a little babysitter, their own personal babysitter, but uh, it's a very important job. I don't mean to joke about it. It's, it is a very high stressful job. And I, you know, being an attorney who's in court and the cases go, you know, through the system rather quickly. And if one of my clients ends up on probation, I may have worked with the person for six, nine months, a year at max, but then they move on to the probation officer who has to work with them for another three to five years, depending on what the conviction is. So they, they work very closely. They get to know those people very well. Um, some of them do their job extremely well. And people are, um, I see a lot of success out of our uh, probation department. But I do joke with my friends that work at the probation department of how they tend to have to babysit. And they do. They agree. They agree. All right. I'm moving on. Treatment. Many of their clients have and will need some form of therapy or programming. And it's probation's job to ensure that it is carried out. At, well, one, that they get the right kind of treatment going. Um, and that might be the probationer sending the client to get assessments at various, um, at various uh, outlets to determine what the need is to be evalu evaluated. But they also have to assist the client in obtaining the necessary assistance as well. And today, a lot of that is done through um, other community services. So do probation any rights, legal rights? They're under a microscope. They're required to do things and refrain from doing things. Otherwise, they face going to jail. That's, that is the alternative, right? Hence, alternative sentences. There are a number of important legal issues that surround probation. One set involving civil rights of probationers and another involving the rights of probationers during the revocation process. Probationers, they have a unique status, as I explained. Uh, they are under the court's thumb. They're not free, so to speak, and they're not incarcerated. So the Supreme Court has said that probationers are entitled to fewer constitutional protections than other citizens. So maybe we, they don't get all of the constitutional protections as a citizen who was not otherwise under a court's authority um, or facing a period of incarceration, that there are some limits. One of those limits on their civil rights is that there is no probation officer client relationship, kind of like an attorney client relationship or a doctor patient relationship, meaning there's no confidentiality. So anything a, a probationer says to their PO can be repeated. Hence, if they are honest with their 
PO about committing a crime, then the, you know that information can be used against the probationer. The general term there's a general term in probation, as I said, is to answer all reasonable inquiries made by the probation officer and to notify them of any police contact, regardless of how minimal. And so if the PO gets them to make statements, the PO isn't, well, it works for the government. It's not technically law enforcement. So we don't have any interrogation issues here or no right to remain silent here. And the PO can use pressure to get that info out of a client or use trickery. So there is no confidentiality. There's no right to remain silent. And the PO can repeat that information, and it can be used against the probationer in any uh, proceeding involving the revocation of the probation sentence. Another civil rights issue is probationer can be subjected to search of their person and their home. This is generally a term specified right in a term of conditions where they agree to uh, allow for search of their person or their home at any time. Uh, including their cell phone. It's usually a condition, but the law has indicated that uh, that they can do that. Probation officers can do that, search the home. Usually what they're looking for is if they can't, you know, if it's a DWI case and they're not allowed to have alcohol, they open the, you know, they open the fridge, is there alcohol? That's what they're looking for. Are you violating your terms? They're not, they're not coming in to do a whole big police showdown. They're usually there to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing not um, hanging out with people you're not supposed to be hanging out with or the, prob uh, the probationer is not supposed to be hanging out with. So let's talk about a probationer's rights relative to the revocation hearing. This is pretty uh, important concept. Formal hearings are scheduled if revocation is a possibility. The probationer just can't be tossed in jail per the probation officer, nor can the court just toss the person in jail without affording the probationer some rights. They're entitled to notification of the charges. Why, what are you claiming I violated? They're entitled to have an attorney and they're entitled to have a hearing on the case under oath in a courtroom for a official determination. The court cannot revoke probation when the sole violation is failure to pay fines or restitution, especially if there is a showing that the offender legitimately is indigent or cannot afford to pay. Lastly, a court cannot sentence a probationer to more time than he or she would have served if he or she was originally sentenced versus being placed on probation. So while an offender's civil liberties may be negatively affected, or limited while on probation, before one is terminated from probation, his or her due process rights remain intact, meaning they're, they're entitled to fair treatment in the court process. So how successful is probation? Well, it is the most commonly used form of alternative sentencing for reasons already discussed, but how successful is it? Well, 60% of probationers are successful, so it's a bit more than half. 15% find themselves, however, locked up again. Most revocations are for technical violations within the first three months, meaning you know they're not going to treatment. That's the most common one. Miss, they're missing appointments with their PO. They might leave the area. So those are called absconding. Those are called technical violations. Something that wouldn't be a technical violation is getting rearrested. Um, however, Probation has been seen as easier to treat offenders because they're in their home environment. Studies have shown that inmates who receive treatment while incarcerated show little improvement versus those who get the treatment while on probation. So that's a success for uh, probation. What about felony probation? About 65% are rearrested, so less than half success rate. But on the upside, probationers are still less likely to reoffend than felons sent to prison for similar crimes. So, who are the ones failing on probation? 
generally those are the ones who have grown up in troubled households, at least that's what the research shows. Probationers with a background of physical and sexual abuse are more likely to fail on probation. Probationers who grew up with family members who were incarcerated uh, for drugs or has been incarcerated in general. Probationers with extensive criminal histories or prior incarcerations also likely to fail on probation. Um, I am not certainly an expert or a criminologist, but in my experience, 20 years experience representing a lot of probationers, um, that last one, prior uh, incarcerations, having criminal histories, that seems to be more of what I would see fail on probation because they have not now been, uh, I guess, institutionalized. A lot do not like to follow rules. They do not like to be told what to do. And that's problematic when you are on probation is to have to follow terms and be under the microscope. So who succeeds? Generally people uh, who are married with children, married probationers with children, uh, those that have lived in the area for two or more years, adequately employed probationers succeed, educated female probationers with stable marriages and employment succeed on probation. You might be wondering well, how'd they end up on probation in the first place? What crime did they commit if they were, you know, employed or married? Well, you would be surprised, trust me. Generally, though, um, DWI, drug use, domestic violence type crimes for, for these, um, these kinds of folks. And that's just my observation through my experience, not through any sort of uh, conducted research, but that's what I see. Uh, identity theft is, is there, especially for women, and theft in general for women, petty theft. So what is the future of probation? Some say probation is shifting from a treatment-oriented uh, casework type method, practices, to a more risk assessment and control practice. Other, others are advocating for reform and propose a number of initiatives for the future of probation. Some are now ongoing, others are in the works. Um, there's a number, of, these are the ones listed in the book. I'll just buzz through them really quick. Making probationers pay for their supervision. That's actually in practice now, at least in this county, Clinton County, when I say this county. Uh, making probation more effective meaning rewarding probation departments when they develop cost-saving measures and reduce probation revocations. Um, legislators, you know, supply more funding. Hotspot probation, using community professionals like police, social services, community members to increase monitoring uh, through helping do home visits and do drug testing. Right now, that probation's tasked with doing all of that. Um, also assisting having those community professionals assisting with reentry into the community through community service or work crews. Uh, focusing on area needs, uh, probation caseloads should be organized around area needs rather than client needs. Um, in some areas, probations generally reside or it concentrated in one specific area. So assigning POs for the area and determining the needs of the area would be more uh, beneficial. Specialized probation. This does exist. That exists here, um, where POs handle one type of offender based on the crime. So they specialize in you know particular needs like all the DWI cases, uh, all the sex offenders, all the domestic violence cases, all the juvenile cases, all of the pins cases. The persons in need of supervision all go to you know one probationer. Private probation contracting with private companies to handle probation needs. Some states already do that, as I said earlier. And then employing swift and sure punishment, the, thrift, uh, uh, the threat of swift and sure punishment for violations versus a full revocation. And we do this here, courts do this here. The individual might get a sanction for a technical violation, say a weekend in jail, if they test positive uh, for drugs or implementing more frequent drug testing, or mandating a treatment, or requiring someone to do community service in the event that there's a, a violation versus um, a full-fledged revocation. 
And those are some things that are referred to as uh, intermediate sanctions, which we are going to talk about next. <laughs> 